Today we're moving ourselves back into the book of Acts, and we are going to be finishing up chapter 1 together. So we are on a journey as a church to study the book of Acts together. We're paying very close attention to everything that God purposed and orchestrated after the ascension and resurrection of Jesus. And the book of Acts is recording for us the early stages of the church era, the period of time between Jesus' ascension and his return, the period of time which is starring the church that Jesus has instituted and created and ordained for this period. So you're going to see on the screen this little graph that shows you where the ascension of Jesus happens, where the second coming of Jesus happens. The disciples were on the early end of that. We're somewhere on the timeline in the middle. We don't quite know when Jesus is coming back. But what the chart shows us is that all of us, the disciples and us, were all living in the same era. We are living in the era of the church, just like the disciples were. So this means the aims, the goals, the pursuits of the early followers of Jesus need to be our pursuits as well. What God was up to in the book of Acts, God is still up to today. It's continuing. It's not that the book of Acts was supposed to happen, and then now we're doing something different. We are continuing onward as people living in the book of Acts. In fact, the way that Luke concludes the book, if we ever get there, is that he leaves the ending of the book open-ended. There's really no conclusion to the book because what Luke is saying is that it's still going on. The three main developments and themes that Luke focuses on in the book are the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, the establishment of the church, and the mission to the world. This is what God was up to in the book of Acts, which means this is what God is up to today. These three markers define this entire era. And we are followers of Jesus living in this era, which means we should be seeking the baptism of the Holy Spirit and operating with the gifts of the Spirit, just like the disciples were. We should be participating in the life of the church, just like the disciples did. And we should be sharing the good news of Jesus with the entire world, just like the disciples did. So as we finish up Acts chapter 1 today, we are going to read about the very last thing that the disciples did before they received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And I did not plan for this to happen. I just think it's really cool that it happened. But next Sunday is Pentecost Sunday. And we're going to preach Acts 2 at the beginning of Acts 2 on Pentecost Sunday. It's just really, it just happened to fall that way for us. But this is the very last thing that the disciples do before they receive the baptism. And the very last thing is they replace Judas with a new disciple. It's the very last thing that they do. They make a very important decision together. So what we're going to be talking about is what does it mean to be Christians and make important decisions? How should we go about those? Are there, is there precedent? Is there guidance in God's word that helps us understand what Christian decision making should look like? I would imagine that throughout our lifetime... You and I are going to be confronted with a large number of important decisions to make, aren't we? This decision that the apostles make is the very first decision that they make without Jesus around. Think about that. For the last couple of years, Jesus had been with them to tell them what to do. He was basically guiding them, helping them, and steering them. Now... He is gone. He's ascended into heaven. They are on their own, and they're making a really big decision together. So I think it's important for us to look at how did the disciples make a decision without Jesus in the room? If Jesus isn't right there to guide us, what practices and what elements of decision making need to happen for us to make good, godly decisions? Some of you might be facing really important decisions today, right here and right now. Something along the lines of, am I going to Culver's after church or am I going to Chick-fil-A? Which one am I going to choose? It's not going to be Chick-fil-A, is it? <laughs> Trick question. 
Uh, I hope everyone has a bulletin today. If you do not have one, would you just raise your hand? Because on the back, we're going to do a quick exercise. So just raise your hand eye in the air. Ajwa and some others might help bring one to you. There are pens in the backs of the seats that we're going to use. So um, not only is the bulletin helpful to tell you what all of our announcements are, give you our links, there's always a section on the back that allows us to take notes and follow along with the sermon if that's something that's beneficial to you. But I'm not asking you to take notes today, but there is a section that I'm going to ask all of us to participate together in right now. Because there is a section in the back of your bulletin that gives you an opportunity to list a few important decisions that you are currently facing or wrestling with right now. Or you might list, we have a couple more hands up and we'll get the bulletins to you. And I'm going to give you a little bit of time to do this, so don't feel rushed. Maybe you're not facing these decisions right now in the immediate, but you know these decisions are coming. You might know that you have a very important decision to make in a year from now. Maybe it's going to be in six months from now. But this is already weighing on your mind and you know that you're going to have to do something and choose something. Uh, maybe it's going to be something along the lines of school. Do I go to school? What school do I go to? What do I do after school? It could be related to your career. Do I stay with my job? Do I change jobs? Um, you know, what, what is God wanting for me in terms of my work? It could have something to do with a relationship. Uh, do I engage in a relationship? Do I pursue marriage with somebody? Do I end a relationship? What do I do about this really important relationship that I have, a friendship or a relationship with my parents that I'm wrestling with? Maybe it has something to do with moving. Do you move the, from the apartment or the home that you're in? Do you move out of state? Do you leave the country? Do you stay where you are? Are you supposed to stay where you are? Maybe you're needing to make some large purchases here in the near future. Maybe it has to do with a car or a home or who knows, right? Like what it could potentially be. I mean, a cell phone is a large purchase nowadays, right? Maybe you need to make some decisions about your children or with your children. Maybe you're taking care of elderly parents and you know that there's decisions to be made coming up. Whatever it are, take some time. There's room for about three decisions that are pressing on you that are way. Maybe you're anxious about these decisions today. Maybe you're feeling overwhelmed by them. Maybe you're just looking for some clarity, looking for some guidance. Even if you're not overwhelmed and you're feeling good about it, let's just write those down and let's have those on the sheet of paper. Is everybody doing that? Is everyone good so far? Everybody good? Yeah. Okay. Does everybody need more time? A little bit more time. Okay. So it is important for us to understand how the disciples make this very first decision without Jesus, because it is going to set a precedent in the book of Acts for how Christians in the early church will keep making decisions moving forward. And we're going to see this pattern repeat itself multiple times as we study the book. And these, what I'm going to share with us today is not all-inclusive to say this has to happen in every single decision. There's other things that might come up. We want to be contextual. We want to be flexible. We don't want to like narrow everything down. But what I'm going to offer us is I'm going to offer us four pillars of Christian decision making, which are pretty broad and generic, which I think are going to be really helpful for us to say if we are following Jesus, this is a good guide for how we should be thoughtfully engaging in a decision making process especially when it comes to larger, more important decisions in our lives. So, the four pillars of the apostles' decision-making that we find here in Acts 1 is we find that they make decisions communally, together. They're not making these decisions by themselves in a vacuum. The second thing that we find is that they make their decisions prayerfully. It is in a state of prayer that they are finding direction, wisdom, and guidance. The third thing is they make their decisions scripturally. They are using scripture to um, 
recognize that we can move forward with this because this is allowed by Scripture, or Scripture tells us that we should be doing this. And then the last one is they make the decision impartially. And that might seem a little bit interesting, like what does that mean? And we're going to talk about that this morning. Acts chapter 1 verse 12 tells us that about 120 of the disciples were in the upper room together. And it says that they were devoting themselves to constant prayer. So the decision to replace Judas with Matthias emerged out of a communal, prayerful environment. 120 of them were together. They were constantly praying. And they make the decision to replace Judas in that environment. I think it's important for us to note that the disciples actually established a healthy practice of prayer and community before the issue and the decision came up. Hear me on this. What is our tendency to do? Oh no, I've got some important decisions to make. Let me pray about it. <laughs> oh, I need some direction, guidance, and help from people. I'm going to start going to church, right? We're reactive. We engage with prayer. We engage with community once we feel the pressure of the decision. But that's not what the disciples did. What the disciples did, they were proactive because their gathering and their praying together was because Jesus instructed them to. And that was it. And it was in them proactively gathering and praying that they felt the need to make this decision. There's a really big difference about am I proactively in prayer and in community or am I reactively engaging in prayer and community because the decisions are now pressing upon me? Does this make sense to everybody? This is crucial to note. Now, I want to say that it's never a bad thing to be motivated to prayer and church involvement from a reactive stance. I'm not saying that. Like, like shame on you. <laughs> if you need to pray, like, you know, like, there's nothing wrong with that, right? There's nothing bad about being in that position to be like, oh, I'm seeking out community because I need wisdom for something and I'm being reactive. That's not, it's not wrong. It's better than not doing it at all, right? What I'm just trying to communicate this morning is that this is not God's best practice or best intention for us. What God really wants for us to be is a community of people that are faithful and steadfast to be together at all times and to be in prayer together at all times. And then we will respond and react to the decisions and the, the elements of life that come our way from this faithful posture together. It's extremely important for us to belabor this point this morning, because if we really think about it, there is no way to truly have a healthy communal decision-making process. It's not sustainable if all we are doing is seeking out prayer and community when we need it. Because if this were the case, our community would be in constant flux, there would be high anxiety in the room at all times, and we would only be a group of people that are in crisis, experiencing instability, or need help with something. In order for any spiritual community to function well, there always needs to be a group of committed people to the community who are there and present when they are not in crisis, when they are not in need, and when they don't need a ton of direction. Some of us need to experience a mental paradigm shift here this morning because our main motivation and our main relationship that we have with prayer and the church is from a position of wanting to always receive something. And what God wants is for us to be a part of a community, not only to receive, but also to give. We need to recognize and understand that it is so vital and important for us to be participating in church and being people of prayer when our life is at its most stable, calm position and when everything seems to be going well for us. Because instead of being desperate to receive something from the community, we are in a position to give and help those who are in that place of need. We can be part of the larger community that helps to be impartial, that helps to offer community support, that brings wisdom, guidance, insight, care, resources, and much more. Think about it. A hospital cannot function with just a bunch of needy sick people coming through the doors. There needs to be nurses, doctors, staff, and other people in the hospital to care for those that are needy and sick. 
So what type of community would we be if we only came into this building or joined together uh, in connectedness when we were sick or needed something? That we have to be present and we have to be around so we can all be doctors, nurses, staff, and offer, provide guidance, care, and help. God doesn't ask you and I to only pray and to only go to church when we need something from him. This creates an unhelpful and unhealthy dynamic. He is looking for a community of people who are faithful and steadfast in their prayer and in their life together. This will allow others to discern with us and help us when we have important decisions to make. And it allows us to discern and help others when they have important decisions to make. So what I've done this morning is I've really just in that first section here talked about the need to be communal and the need to be prayerful. Those are the first two elements of Christian decision making. But our passage today, we're going to focus on verses 20 through 26. These passages are going to show us how the disciples were being scriptural and impartial in their decision making. That's going to be the emphasis of what we're going to talk about this morning. So now that we know that we need to be prayerful and communal in a proactive way, not in a reactive way, we are then going to see how we engage in the next two steps, the next two pillars together as we do that. We're going to explore this. So as the disciples prepare to make a decision about replacing Judas, the first thing that we see starting in verse 20 is that Peter appeals to Scripture. All right. And this is why we know Christian decision making needs to be scriptural. Peter says in verse 20, it is written in the book of Psalms. May his place be deserted. Let there be no one to dwell in it. And may another take his place of leadership. Therefore, it is necessary to choose one of the men who have been with us the whole time that Jesus was living among us. Beginning from John's baptism to the time when Jesus was taken up from us. For one of these must become a witness with us of his resurrection. Peter is feeling the pressing need to replace Judas because he is feeling scripture telling him to do that. Now, Peter quotes two passages from the book of Psalms, and one of them is from Psalm 69, verse 25, and the other is from Psalm 109, verse 8. And this really can cause us to scratch our heads a little bit because we can look at what Peter is quoting and say, how are you getting that from this? Because David in the Psalms is not specifically writing about Judas. He's writing about his enemies. He is writing in Psalm 69 about what he would like to see God do to his enemies. He would like for his enemies' place to be deserted and for there no one to be dwelling in it. And he is wanting for another to take the place of leadership. Maybe this was written about King Saul as David was maybe before king and he was being tormented by Saul. I don't quite know. But it doesn't seem like it's easy to go from point A to point B here and say, oh, yeah, Peter, I understand exactly why you use these passages. And I don't have any easy answers for you and I today to help us understand Peter's mindset. It's a little bit confusing to me. Why does he pull these two specific verses out as scriptural reference for Judas? It feels like a bit of a reach and it's a bit out of context to me. So what I can offer us this morning is that. The Hebrew people began, when they began to recognize Jesus as the Messiah, as the fulfillment of Old Testament scriptures, they began to connect certain dots together. And it didn't happen overnight, but the community as a whole began to see where Jesus was fitting into. There was messianic passages that they knew the Messiah was going to fit into, but then they began to see other passages as well. The Jewish people had a deep, long-standing tradition and understanding of prophetic literature, especially when it came to their scriptures. And they also began to see and understand certain passages that were very familiar to them in a new light based upon their experiences with Jesus and his teachings. So all I can offer us this morning is that Peter would not have just pulled passages, passages out of thin air and just said, oh, this sounds good. There was actually a tradition and a process and the rabbis and the scribes, there was, there was ways for them to read scripture together that we're not quite as familiar with today. And they were connecting certain dots in a very uh, cultural, culturally accepted communal way. 
They knew how to apply Old Testament scripture to modern day events, even though their process is a bit unfamiliar to us. And the level to which most Jewish people knew the writings of the Torah, the prophets, the wisdom books, and the historical books in the Old Testament was extremely impressive. It blows our level of scriptural understanding out of the water. Let's just be honest. They memorized it. They knew it. Their knowledge of scripture was probably way beyond where you and I are at today. So when Peter says, here's the two passages that tell us that we need to replace Judas and how we're going to go about doing this. And we're sitting here going, I don't quite know what you're saying here, Peter. Luke understood it just fine. And Luke is writing about it. The community, the 120 didn't push back. They didn't fight. They understood what was going on just fine. They all had a commonly understood scriptural basis for why they thought that this made sense and was logical and why Peter was pointing to these two verses. We also notice in, these, in this section that in addition to the scriptural understanding, there was some also communal expectations, qualifications, and parameters that they all recognized needed to be met by whoever filled their vacancy. The person, whoever was going to become the next disciple, had to be someone who had been part of Jesus' ministry since Jesus had been baptized. And this person also needed to have been a witness to the resurrection of Jesus. So the decision-making was influenced by Scripture, and it was done within confines of communal agreement and expectations. So as followers of Jesus... We do not live with complete freedom and permission to make decisions in our lives any way that we want to. That doesn't sound good, does it? That sounds restrictive. The thing is, is that we are to be searching for the Lord's direction and guidance. And that often has to come first through the word of God. And then we have to also think about the expectations and the parameters of the community. We are becoming a member church of our denomination this year, the Evangelical Covenant Church. And we have six affirmations that we hold to, which are the foundation and the core of our denomination. And our very first affirmation concerns scripture, and it says this. We affirm the centrality of the word of God. We believe the Bible is the only perfect rule for faith, doctrine, and conduct. The dynamic transforming power of the word of God directs the church and the life of each Christian. Does God's word direct your life and direct our church? Or are we just making decisions based upon what we think is best? Do we take our plans? Do we take the important things that are coming down the pipeline for us? And do we evaluate them according to God's word and say, how should I react? What choice should I make? What decision should I make? Because I am submitting myself under the authority of this text and allowing it to guide me. Or are we being too individualistic, making decisions when we want, how we want, not bringing our spiritual family into the process, not looking at scripture? As disciples, we have an obligation. As a follower of Jesus... We have an obligation to let the Bible and to let our spiritual family speak into our lives and help guide our decision-making process. Just to give you guys a little bit of insight into how Kara and I sometimes make large decisions in our lives. Some of the questions that we ask ourselves, and maybe these will be helpful for you in terms of your decision-making process. One of the first questions that we ask whenever we are feeling like we want to make a decision on something is we ask ourselves, is God leading and prompting this decision through prayer and through his word? Is this God or is this just us? That's a question that we want to have answered. The next question that we ask ourselves is, is there a sense of agreement and unity between us as a couple? Or are we sort of on different sides of the spectrum on this? We also invite other people into the process, letting them know that we are thinking of making a decision. So we invite trusted people from our church community to pray with us so that they can experience, hopefully, the confirmation that we are experiencing. We also sit down in a very practical way and we make out a pros and cons list together. I don't know if you've ever done that about a large decision. And we look at what the pros and we look at what the cons might be. So we want that data in front of us. Another really important question that we ask, 
does this decision help us live more fully into the work of the kingdom of God? I would bet that this is a question that many of us do not ask when we are making large decisions with our career, our money, our time, relationships, you name it. Are we asking this question? If I say yes to this or if I say no to this, does me making this decision help me live more fully into what God is up to in the world today? Another question I like to ask myself is, am I trying to run from something or am I trying to follow Jesus? A lot of the decisions we make, we're making reactively because we're uncomfortable. We don't like what we're, where we're at, what's going on. So we make decisions to, to alleviate our pain and our discomfort. And we are not being motivated by trying to follow Jesus. We're just trying to get rid of something. And the last question is, am I operating from a place of anxiousness or am I operating from a place of centeredness? Am I operating from a place of feeling at peace and content in where I am with God and who I am with God? Or am I feeling highly stressed, highly anxious about what's going on? Because we tend not to make really good decisions when we're in a place of high anxiety. So those are just a couple of questions that we like to ask ourselves as we begin to like make larger decisions in our lives. We want to make those decisions scripturally. We want to make them prayerfully. And we want to invite the community of believers into the process with us. Some of this stuff might sound super like crazy to you. Because the reality is, is for the most part, as followers of Jesus, we're not talking about this stuff in our churches. What we're just talking about is just like surrender your life to Jesus. And it's a very individualistic form of Christianity is what we present to ourselves and we present to others. But the book of Acts is presenting a more communal aspect of how it is to follow Jesus within the body. And that's what we're trying to figure out. So as the disciples prepared to make a decision, they not only Peter not only brought scripture into the mix, then they cast lots. Interesting, right? It says in verse 23 that they nominated two men, Joseph called Barsabbas and Matthias. Then they prayed, Lord, you know everyone's heart. Show us which of these two you have chosen to take over this apostolic ministry, which Judas left to go where he belongs. It's an odd statement. <laughs> then they cast lots and the lot fell to Matthias. So he was added to the 11 apostles. This element of the story, so Peter's element, the scriptures that Peter was using made us scratch our heads a little bit. This sort of makes us feel a little bit uneasy because it's like, were these people gambling? Were they leaving this, this decision to chance and just like rolling the dice? Does this mean that I can go to the casino tonight, drink a couple rusty nails, throw the roulette, you know, uh, ball? God, if it lands on black, you're saying yes. If it lands on red, you're saying no. That's sort of what it feels like, doesn't it? Many of you don't know what a rusty nail is, and that's okay. <laughs> Proverbs chapter 16, verse 33. The lot is cast into the lap, but its every decision is from the Lord. So we have the book of Proverbs giving us this idea of casting lights in a positive light. It's saying there's wisdom in doing this. For the disciples, the casting of lots wasn't them gambling. They weren't trying to test God. They weren't trying to have him be like miraculous and make whatever, however they cast the lots, like roll a certain way, land a certain way. This was their way of making a wise, impartial decision without their ulterior motives getting in the way. Let me say that again. This was their way of making a wise, impartial decision without ulterior motives getting in the way. The NIV application commentary says that according to the biblical usage, lots seem to have been used only when the decision was important and where wisdom or biblical injunctions did not give sufficient guidance. One of the advantages of the casting of lots was the impartiality of the choice. So when we look at the full context of what was happening here, casting the lots was the very last thing they did. There was a whole bunch of work that went into this decision before they cast the lots. 
I think if they would have cast the lots first, that would have been problematic. But what they did was they spent time in prayer together. They were in community together. They were discerning together. They appealed to scripture together. They evaluated all of the candidates within the specified guidelines of the community. And they narrowed things down to the two final individuals. And it was only at this point of the process, after they had the final two candidates, did they say the best thing as we have prayed together is to cast the lot. Who is going to get chosen, and why is that person going to get chosen? I would imagine that at this point, the disciples and the community had the awareness to recognize they had limitations and shortcomings in terms of how they would approach choosing between these two individuals. Maybe they thought that each person in the room might be wanting to choose one of the individuals over the other because of some selfish, self-centered reason. Why would I want Matthias? Why would I want the other guy? Barsabbas. Maybe one, we had a personal affinity because I liked the personality of that person better. I had a closer friendship or relationship with that person. I had a feeling I could trust that person more. Right? And all of a sudden, these ulterior motives and these things that are going on inside of us as people begin to emerge. And instead of making an impartial decision, we're making a decision based upon our own biases. The casting of lots refrains us from doing that. Maybe they didn't want the decision to be a popularity contest. Maybe they didn't want personality traits to get in the way. Maybe these two individuals had made mistakes in the past. And they didn't want those mistakes to be held against them. Maybe they didn't want to open the door for the opportunity for someone who came from a more prestigious family or someone who had more wealth or someone who had more opportunity to benefit them getting that role. Maybe they didn't trust themselves to make this decision fairly. Where, whatever the case may be, I'm making a bunch of assumptions right now. The decision to cast the lot was a decision to be as impartial as possible, saying we have come to the conclusion that both of these individuals are highly qualified and any of them would be, either of them would do us well by serving in this role. So let's just throw the dice, roll the, you know, whatever it is that we do, and we'll just let that choose impartially. It's interesting to know that this is the last time in scripture, it's not referenced to a lot, but it is the last time that the Bible talks about casting lots. It's the very last time. It's never, it never happens again, and it's never alluded to again. The NIV commentary was helpful for me again here, and they write, it is probable that the disappearance of the casting of lots in scripture is related to the coming of the Holy Spirit, who is now the great guide of the believers. The fact that it is mentioned just before the record of Pentecost may suggest that Luke wants to highlight the truth that this is a symbol of the end, the signing off, as it were, of an old era. We don't need to cast lots anymore because we have the gift of the Holy Spirit. And where we want to be impartial and where we want to make good, wise decisions that don't benefit our self-interest, we don't need to use dice to do it anymore. All we need to do is rely on the Holy Spirit now to help us make the right choices. Isn't that amazing? The Holy Spirit helps us overcome our biases. The Holy Spirit helps us overcome our leanings, our motivations, helping us make wise, impartial decisions that are no longer fueled by our motivations, but fueled by the heart of God. One last illustration that I want to give before we close today is when I was in seminary, I was working at a very prestigious restaurant in downtown Chicago. And we were moving, we had moved from no Michelin stars and we were moving up to two Michelin stars. It was great, I had, was making great money, we had incredible health insurance as a family, but what was happening was I was feeling very overwhelmed because the demands of the job were really, really high. Mm -hmm. And I was trying to go to school full time, be a parent, you know, try to allocate all these things and also work. And an opportunity came my way to work at another restaurant 
uh, that a friend of mine said, hey, there's a new restaurant opening. I, you know, we would love for you to meet with the owners, and we think I think you'd be a good fit. And it was a family-run restaurant that offered no health care. There was no prestige to the restaurant yet because it hadn't opened, right? We, would we get Michelin stars? I don't know if we would have gotten them or not. We, we never did, by the way. Um, there was just a lot of things. It was so unknown. I didn't even know how much money would I make at this restaurant because it, it would be brand new. How busy would we be? I, there, I didn't know what to do. So in the end, like it's like I'm going to Scripture, but Scripture's not telling me what to do, right? Like there's nothing in there that's like making you like, how do you choose between these two jobs, right? So what I needed to do was I needed to be prayerful. I needed to be talking with Kara. We needed to invite others in. You know, where scripture wasn't offering us the advice that we needed, it needed to be a reliance on the Holy Spirit Amen. for his guidance and his direction. And sometimes when we rely on the direction and guidance of the Holy Spirit, you're feeling the leaning and the prompting to do things that feel riskier, that don't feel as safe, and they don't feel as comfortable. But we can make the decision so my partiality <laughs> would be to stay in the current job because I had the health care. I had the stable income. I knew what was going on, but I knew I was overwhelmed, but maybe it's like I just need to figure it out and work it out, maybe take less credit hours, whatever it would be. That would have been my preference, but I really did feel like the Holy Spirit was saying, take this new job. It's going to be better for you, and it's going to be better for your family. Give up those things. So the Holy Spirit comes in with a more partial decision-making to overcome my biases, my fears, and my insecurities. As we close today, 